Hi, welcome everyone and welcome to another uh, conversation about CVI with myself, Professor John Ravenscroft. And I'm really pleased uh, to introduce uh, uh, Associate Professor uh, Lofi Meribet. Hi, how are you doing Lofi? How are you doing? How are you? Good to see you, John. Pleasure. Yeah, good, good, good. So um, I'm currently, as you know, just outside of um, sunny Edinburgh. And it's, uh, oh, I like to do a weather chat, you see. And it's about <laughs> 14, 15 degrees Celsius here. How are, okay. How's it with you? Wonderful sunny day, beautiful sunset as you can see behind me. Uh, couldn't couldn't be better. Fantastic. All right. So I know that you are the director of the Visual Neuroplasticity Lab uh, right. at Massachusetts Ear uh, Eye and Ear. I've got to get the order right. right. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of those terms. You know, yeah. uh, visual neuroplasticity and uh, Massachusetts uh, um, uh, uh, Hospital there, and um, right. associate professor. Uh, mm -hmm. at Harvard Medical School. Excellent. So mm -hmm. that's, that's who I think you are. <laughs> but who do you think you are? And what is it that you do? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's a very good question, John. I think uh, the best way I can describe it is I, I, I wear multiple hats. You know, at one level, I'm an optometrist. And as a clinician, I'm very interested in trying to help people with visual impairment, both from uh, ocular as well as brain-based causes. Uh, so I'm very interested in habilitation and rehabilitation and uh, helping individuals stay independent. From uh, a scientific standpoint, I'm also a neuroscientist. So I'm also very interested in understanding how the brain adapts to visual impairment, again, both from ocular and, uh, and brain-based uh, causes. Because I think by understanding how the brain adapts, how the brain handles information in that context, we can get cue, uh, uh, clues in terms of, of coming up with strategies for habilitation and rehabilitation. And then the last thing I would say is I, I have a background in public health, so I'm very, very interested in using that clinical side and that neuroscience information to try to leverage uh, improving public health status for people with disabilities in general. I think uh, bringing a scientific perspective uh, is extremely important. It brings data, it brings structure, uh, it brings evidence in a manner that I think can help drive decisions at the public uh, health level. All right, good. So I, I'm, I'm going to ask a, a couple of sort of, as, as what we say in Scotland, daft laddie questions. Okay. <laughs> uh, and, and it's like, why... Um, so I'm a psychologist, as you know, and uh, so I measure behavior, right? Yeah, and uh, yeah. you know, deep down, I'm probably still a behaviorist, right? Sure. All psychologists are, no matter what sure. they think, right? right? Sure. So, so I, and, and I look at behavior, and I measure behavior, and I, and yeah. I look at the thing. Right? So why, why do I want to bother looking inside a brain? Why do, why, why, <laughs> why do I need to do that stuff? Right? I don't need to yeah. do that. I can yeah. just measure behavior. Sure. I mean, listen, it's a fair question. And, and, and it's one that I actually had to decide uh, very early on in my career as well. I, I remember when I started graduate school, uh, it was a program in neuroscience. And there were two, two aspects, two paths. You could go clinical psychology, or you could go more sort of hardcore neuroscience, imaging, electrophysiology, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I chose the latter. And I think basically what it comes down to is whether or not you can deal with the fact that it's a black box. You can measure behavior, you know, and I think that's extremely important and you can certainly do that in a very valid and controlled manner. But at the end of the day, you don't really know what the inner workings are. For me, I want to know what the inner workings are. I want to know what's in the black box, you know. I, I guess yeah. an anal you know, I guess an analogy would be like to have a clock. You know, you can certainly you can measure time, you can do, you can time things, you can do all sorts of things. But at the end of the day, I want to know how the clock works. And I think for me, going in with tools like imaging allow me to do that. Yeah, the clock one's quite a good one because it's always yeah. at that level of description. Because right. When you go in and you look at the inner workings of the clock, there's no yeah. way you can tell the time. Right? That's right. <laughs> that, that's absolutely true. That's absolutely true. But if you are someone who believes fundamentally that there is a brain behavior relationship, that the two go together, in my mind, that's, it's more satisfying. That, that causality, that interaction for me, I think is very, very important. It, it, if you can put it all together, I think would be very, very important. And I agree with you. I, I have colleagues who are the ultimate reductionists, exactly what you said. They spend their whole life studying the gears, but they have no concept of what time is. <laughs> you know, I don't think that's, that's necessarily better. So I, I, I really try to find that middle ground where the two interact as much as possible. All right, excellent. Good, good, good. Yeah. Yeah. All right, as we know, both, both of us have a, 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 a significant interest in um, uh, cerebral visual impairment, 
got this impairment. Sure. You're not too fussed about terms on, on these chats. What right. I am going to say though is, oh look, Lottie, right? Let's not kid <laughs> ourselves. Look, ocular visual impairment, cerebral vision impairment, low vision, it's all the same, mate, isn't it? Clearly, it's it's, it's all the same. <laughs> it's low vision, it's just low vision. I, 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 honestly, I, I couldn't disagree more. And I think, and I think that's the problem. And, and I think that's exactly how part of the reason why we got in this difficult situation is because we assumed everything was the same on multiple levels, on the clinical level, on the education level. And most importantly, I think on the, on the, on the level of registration and benefits, uh, you know, all those sort of things. So I, I think it really does have to be uh, decomposed, if you will, or separated in a manner that we can do this more on a case by case basis. So I think it's extremely important. My rationale is the following, you know, certainly, and, and I'll, I'll use um, an analogy that Gordon Dutton um, uh, once, once published. He said, ocular visual impairment is kind of like a filter right? Then it's, it's sort of filtering or changing how visual information is entering the brain with an otherwise neural machinery that's intact, right? CVI is a condition where it's not really so much about the filter, it's more about the processing of the brain that's fundamentally different. So just, just in those simple terms, you can understand that we're talking about two very, very different things. They may present with similarities like acuity, visual field deficits, and so on. But the reality is, is we're talking about two very, very different scenarios. So I think that has obviously a translation from the clinical side, how we assess these individuals. It has uh, implications from the education side, how we educate, habilitate, and, and rehabilitate these individuals. And very important from a legislative standpoint, it's extremely important because, as you know, in the case of CVI, there are plenty of individuals who don't necessarily have severe visual acuity deficits or visual field deficits, but are clearly visually impaired right? From a processing standpoint, how do we make sure these people don't fall through the cracks? So by understanding the condition and understanding that it's not the same as OVI or all, all low vision is the same, that we are able to, I think, tailor programs, benefits, and so on for, for individuals. Yeah. And I think for me, that's a really important point there. Mm. Of course, you know, that I was joking earlier mm. on. And mm. I think it's that, um, you know, that intervention, that tailoring of the programs, if you were right. just assume that low vision is the same no matter what right you know then then you're going to do you know I, I generally believe you know certainly not any good but possibly some harm by just Absolutely. assuming that this is this is you know they're all, you lump this all together you know and, and I guess this is part of the discussion that I've had with Gordon and with other people about the sensitivity of our instruments you know to measure right. Measure this, that's right. Program. And I guess that's part of where you're coming in now. Is is like, okay, you've got your OVI assessments here, but you right. need to go more than that. I I, I agree, I, and I think the functional vision aspect becomes more and more important when you look at it from a brain-based injury as opposed to an ocular-based uh, visual impairment. Um, again, a lot of the strategies, as you know, the classic things, you know, contrast, luminance, magnification. Why? Because it's essentially an optical phenomenon. We use essentially optical strategies to get to bypass that filter problem so that the rest of the machinery can do its thing, so to speak. But if the problem is fundamentally with the processor, you have to change your strategy. You have to understand, first of all, what's wrong with the processor and how to enhance information so that it can handle it in a manner that's, that's optimal. Just gonna pick you up on that, uh, mm. uh, if I can. Mm. So let me, let me go back to the clock, right? I think the sure. clock is useful. Sure. Right? Mm. So, in order for me to understand the workings of a clock, right? I know, uh, you know, I can take it apart. And I, I can take a working clock apart, right? I can, I can take a work. You know where this is going. I can take a working sure. clock apart and go, look, well, that's fine. Blah 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 yeah. blah blah. Okay. Yeah. When I look at a brain with CVI, right? Yeah. Yeah. A, I don't know really exactly how vision works. Right. right. <laughs> I don't right. know how that clock really works together. Yeah. So yeah. So, 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 what is it like for you when you're working and you're looking at that brain? We all yeah. know roughly what the brain does. We know what the lobe does and the subcortices and things. But yeah. so, so, how does that work for you? Well, going back to that same analogy, um, you know, let me let me give it to you. You know, present it to you this way. I have a clock that I know clearly isn't telling the correct time, right? Yeah. I have this clock, for example, compared to other clocks, and this clock is clearly not telling the right time. Well, what I would do is take apart that clock 
take apart the clocks that are telling the right time and look for differences. And there could be many reasons. It could be the gears aren't the same. It could be that one gear is working differently than another. It could be uh, the pieces are, are completely different as well. So again, going back to that earlier conversation about brain and behavior, I think it gives us more information. It's not just a question of identifying there's something wrong or that it's not telling the right time. It's again, going back to this causality issue. Um, it doesn't mean that I could then build a better clock after, but it certainly tells me that I have a better understanding. It just becomes less nebulous. You know, I think, I think part of what we should be doing for the case of CVI is, is sort of demystifying it. You know, um, that's certainly the trend that it's been for neuroscience in general. Right. We, we, you know, we always had this idea that well, the brain is the brain and, and that's it. But as we started going more into more detail, we, you know, we demystified the complexity of it and it helped us understand other, other conditions, neurodevelopmental disorders, uh, psychiatric disorders. And I think it kind of appeased the population a little bit of saying, you know what, we can understand this. It almost kind of brings faith, if you will to the field. That's not to say again, that we will build a better clock once we figure this all out, but it certainly helps us have a better understanding of what's going on. And, and from my perspective, I think that's extremely important. Again, speaking from personal experience, talking to, to individuals with CVI and their families, I think they like knowing what's going on. They, they like having a sort of mechanistic understanding of what is going on with their child, for example. And I, I think that has value. I think, um, uh, oh, oh, absolutely, mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that, that has huge value. Mm -hmm. I'm going to move away from the clock analogy a little bit mm -hmm. because, um, you know, if you see a broken clock, uh, uh, the gears may be all broken and, and that's it. But that's, right. not the, that's not the case with the brain. We get, and I think it's the, it's the title of your lab, and here I'm going to come back to it, this, sure. this, this magical term, and for those yeah. who are following <laughs> these conversations uh, of, of neuroplasticity, Yes, yes. So um, I can't ask the director of the neuroplastic lab, <laughs> to say, what do you mean by that? <laughs> sure, sure. So I, you know, obviously it's a question I get, I get asked a lot and it's in the title of the lab, as you said, so I better have a good <laughs> understanding of what I think the term is. I mean, my, my take is this, neuroplasticity is the inherent ability of the brain to change its structure and its function in response to environmental circumstances. It could be learning, it could be damage, it could be uh, sensory deprivation, for example. I think the important thing to think about is neuroplasticity isn't necessarily a good or a bad thing. It's not something you can just turn on, you know. It's an inherent property of the brain. It's how it works. What we need to do as scientists is to understand what are the constraints and the limits of plasticity so that we can use it as a leverage in the case of, of rehabilitation or habilitation. That's, I think, the ultimate goal. It's going to happen. You know, the old gag is, you know, three things, death, taxes, and neuroplasticity. They're going to happen, <laughs> you know. The question is, is can you understand it? Hmm. Can, you, can you understand the constraints? And can you leverage it in a matter that's beneficial? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can you that's, it in yeah. a way as well? That's right. That's right. I mean, every, uh, 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 whilst it's an, an inherent property, and I love that right. description of, of yeah. neuroplasticity, yeah. I, I think that, what we don't want to uh, believe that it's the case that, oh, it will happen for all children in, the, in this way, in exactly the same manner. I mean, that just doesn't Correct. happen. So that, that, that's that's absolutely true. Yeah, that's absolutely true. I think, it, you know, I think there's almost sort of a magical quality about it that people think, you know, like this will somehow, you know, is the cure all and oh, not to worry, there's neuroplasticity. And I said, yeah, there is neuroplasticity. But it's again, it's not a, it's not a magic potion or something. It's, it's a reality. It's going to happen, but we have to understand what the constraints are. To give you a simple example, much easier to learn a language when you're five than when you're 50. Why is that? neuroplasticity. You can still learn a language when you're 50, but what do we know? It has to be much more intense. It has to be much more repetitive. It has to be uh, much more engaging than when you were, for example, at five years old. Why do we know that? Neuroplasticity. Again, it's the constraints of how the brain works that gives us some clues about why things are different in time and why things are different also in terms of, uh, of difficulty or tasks as well. So it's a framework. It's not so much a, a, a magical thing per se, but it's a way of thinking about how the brain works. Yeah, yeah and, that, and that's obviously hugely important when we come mm. into visual processing. You know, that's I mean, right. brain, so much of the brain is dedicated towards it, you know, and, 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 and just trying to understand those mm. things 
great. So like you say, that yeah. leverage of that neuroplasticity. Yeah. So that's what you do. That's yeah. your day job. Yeah, I, I, I would say so. <laughs> I spent a lot of time thinking about it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Hey, man, I, I just get you to fill out some forms and I'll just clean it up. <laughs> all, <right. laughs> all right, we'll talk. <laughs> all right, okay. So, um, look, I, I know some of your work quite well and you know, you know some of mine. Um, mm -hmm. Let's mm -hmm. talk a little bit about, about vision then. Let's talk yeah. about um, uh, sort of this bottom up and top down yeah. sort of vision, right? Okay, yeah. so, so what's that all about? What, what's this bottom up and what's this top down? Do you want to explain that to me? Yeah, so it, it's certainly a framework that's been around for, for quite some time. Um, it's true not just for vision, but vision is a very, very good model, I think, to to discuss this idea. Basically, the idea is that that, that visual perception is, is a marriage, if you will, of two processes that have to be coordinated. Bottom-up reflects to information that is entering from the environment into the eye and then into the brain. It's generally sort of simple cues. It's things like luminance, contrast, edges, things like that. It's the input that's entering the brain. Top-down is really everything that you have previously seen, your memories, your repertoire, your expectations, what you expect to do with that information once it comes in. And those two have to drive, they have to intersect. And, and when they intersect, perception happens in a way that appears logical to you, mm -hmm. right? Um, there's a couple of things just to add to that point. We know that early in development, bottom-up uh, information is much larger than top-down. Why? Because as that child is growing, they haven't built that repertoire yet and expectations and so on and an understanding of the physical world around it. So bottom up information is much more uh, powerful, if you will, than top down. As the child grows, as the individual grows and that repertoire gets larger and larger, we know that top down has a much larger influence than bottom up. Right. What I would argue in the case of CVI is that top down influence is not anywhere as strong as it should be and it doesn't always match. And I think that mismatch between bottom up and top down information is related to the perceptual problems that a child with CVI has. Let me give you a, 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 contextual, a contextual example. Visual illusions, we're all familiar with these sort of yeah. things, Escher yeah. and so on, are great examples to understand this mismatch of bottom up and top down, right? The bottom up information is telling you this is there, this is there. Your previous expectations and visual repertoire tells you that doesn't make sense. And the illusion is an illusion because there's a mismatch between the two, right? And again, visual psychophysics, uh, physicists, I should say, and, and visual perception scientists have known this for quite some time. My suspicion, and again, I do not have hard evidence of this, it's just a conceptual framework that I'm trying to, to kind of get my head around, is that in the case of CVI, that mismatch happens more often than it should. In other words, what the child is perceiving versus what they are expecting in terms of, uh, of what to, how to react on that information is disjointed somehow. And I think that disjointed uh, or, or the lack of that connection is because of the neural injury itself. The connections simply are not there. Okay, that's really, really interesting. Lots of things. Yeah. Lots of things. Just a quick aside, I can't flip. You know the young lady, old lady? I oh, really? Yeah, yeah, I can't, do, I can't do the um, young lady. I have to get my students to tell me where it is, right? Oh, that's so interesting. Which, which one do you see? Because there's a piece to that. You, I'm, I'm not sure if you're aware. Wh yeah, which one no, do you no, see? I, I see the old lady. Right. So do you know that there's actually a parametric relationship between your age and what you're going to perceive? Oh, is there really? Oh, the right. older you are, the more likely you'll see the older lady. Oh, right, right. Yeah, I used which to be is, able yeah. to see the young lady, but I can't do it anymore. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> I hate to say it, but we're getting older, John. Oh, no. <laughs> right, if you, so, get, if you needed back. more proof, there it is. <laughs> yeah. Like, put the old lady, I, I, young lady up. Yeah. All right. Okay. So look, look. Yeah. Is it is it is it an expectation? So if if that top down and there's yeah. an expectation there, that means it, it's it, it's already there, or not. Uh, I, I would argue in the case of CVI, it's not already there. Right, it's okay. not complete. And, and, that's, and I think that's the issue. I, you know, I, I, I've said that the job of the brain is to create an internal model of the world, right? So it can yeah. make, it, it, almost as if it can run simulations, it can make predictions, it can manipulate information so that it can act on it. In my mind, that is fundamentally the role of the brain. Takes information in, 
analyzes it, and then act and, and then acts on it. I would think in the case of CVI, because of this neural injury, because of this of this impairment in connectivity, that internal model is somehow fragmented, or is not as complete as it should be, in compared to say an individual with neurotypical development. And I think that is what creates that that mismatch, as I say. It also makes it also understandable why there's so much heterogeneity because everybody's model is different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I think it, it gives us an understanding, well, how is your model impaired versus another model and so on. And I think that's kind of what it boils down to is the inability to take in information and manipulate it in a way that is predictable or fits with your understanding of the world. Yeah, yeah. And also, I, I, I guess, if you, I kind of like channel theory and systems. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So yeah. if you've got that perception mismatch going, meeting the uh, uh, bottom up. Yeah. But that signal may be weaker as well. It might be it, absolutely it's there as well. So it might actually hit, but it's but it's so weak. It's it's not it's not really connecting. If, if absolutely, if my fingers is that analogy. I, I absolutely see it that way. You, you can, you know, one example that I hear a lot in clinic as well is I don't understand. My child was able to track moving objects very easily, you know, when they were young, you know, at the age, you know, one or two. And then about three or four, they had a hard time all of a sudden. Why is that? Well, we know that from, again, from the inner workings of the clock that we can actually have a rationale as to why that's the case. Because we know at the age of one and two, that's largely a bottom up system. You're using subcortical structures. You are detecting motion. You're picking up on it. It's a very rudimentary, simple motion detection system. But as the cortex, the rest of the clock is becoming online, it's not picking up on that. And there is that mismatch. So how could something all of a sudden be simple and then harder later? Again, is because you are exposing, I believe, that mismatch between the two systems. Right, right. And, yeah. and clearly, that has huge implications for early intervention strategies and things like that. I, I, I would agree. I, I, I can't, you know, tell you on, you know, in a firm way what exactly needs to be done, but it certainly strikes me that we have to think carefully about those intervention strategies, for sure. Because the moment of opportunity, I think, is, 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 a, is something we need to consider. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, absolutely. And, and I guess... Is there, is there a, I think we talk in terms of critical periods. Mm. Is there a critical period or, or we don't know, we're not there yet? I, I think the, the critical period uh, concept, I think, is, is certainly legitimate. We see that across, you know, the, the entire animal kingdom. I think the mammalian brain, and particularly the primate brain, is, is very complex because there's so many uh, critical periods. There, there's a critical period for vision, a critical period for motor function, a critical period for audition. And I think the big, big issue uh, in the case of the primate brain is the fact that we have language, communication. That ties into a lot of this critical period development because language in my mind is a scaffolding that puts all of these senses into context and allows you to build that mental model. So I think the critical period aspect is broad it's not, you know, an open and, and shut door. But I think when you take into consideration that so many aspects of development are coming and interacting at the same time, and not only have to happen correctly, but interact correctly, you can understand how things can, can go wrong and have obviously sequelae and domino effects later in the, in the child's development. Yeah, that's really interesting. And, and, and I, obviously, we, we talk before we go mm. on. And things mm. like that, just in case people mm. go, "Hey, he's giving him such a hard time." <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's all it's all collegial. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. so this is where I think you and I slightly differ. I mm. think a little mm. bit. I, I, I'm just not entirely yet convinced that it's language. I, I think it's something proto language. You see, I think it's okay. Early. And I, I think it's that ability to do multiple classification. Right. Okay. I, I, so lang all languages, you get it, it's a sequential stream and we classify, right? We classify the, the sentences and the stream in, in one way. It's, right? it's a sequential process, I think. Whereas I think the ability to do multiple classification and to do it very quickly is, is, is pre-language, right? We do it before we have language, I think. I think, I think that is, is, for me, is, is, is part of that scaffolding. It's my PhD, so I've got to say it, right? So, so, so I, I, I wonder if, I wonder if language is, is, is disguising that classification nature. I, 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 that's, 
that's my conceptual theory, right? Uh, and we had some technical difficulties. I'll go back a little bit. So, um, so in my doctoral work a long, long time ago, I was really interested in the nature of something that's before language, I think. I think it's that nature of classification, being able to classify, right? Because I see language as this sequential stream, it coming in, we're processing the words, we're, we're dividing up the words, and for me, that's just language, okay? So that's just really language. So, so I, I wonder if, if in fact, it's la language is disguising um, the classification as the scaffold, and being mm. able to not classify I think perhaps is is like a, certainly a precursor to some of this mismatch that you that you well described. So this is my conceptual idea. That, yeah, that classification. I, I no, I, I still agree with with your points. I, I and I and I don't think that's removed from from the overall idea. I I, I think language is 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 how they accept they access that classification. You know, I, I certainly think that makes sense that the classification is prelingual and, and it's something very, very innate and something early on. There's no question. But the ability to access it through language, I think, allows you to manipulate that information in a way that perhaps you wouldn't otherwise. You know, I think of individuals that we work with with CVI who do verbal mediation in order yeah, to, quote, yeah. see. You know, I think that's a nice, and that's really where a lot of these ideas, you know, came out of, you know, I, I asked these individuals who are, you know, very, very in tune to what they're doing. And they say, yeah, you know, I, you know, two eyes, nose, a mouth, face, exactly what you just described. But instead of it being automatic, as it, as it typically is in, neuro, in, in neurotypical development, they've used language to access that classification information. They've, they've made something implicit, explicit through language and that becomes their mechanism it's really intriguing there's there's one individual for example who tells me it's, it's really quite striking is that he cannot see and have a conversation at the same time yeah yeah one yeah. or the other for example you know so i think that's what it is and, and and that's a lot about brain function in general not just the visual system is that things are wired in a way to be as automatic and autopilot as possible because that has evolutionary value you don't have to overthink everything, right? Yeah, you yeah. Want thing, yeah, you want things to be automatic, right? And generations and generations and generations of evolution will make that hardwired in a matter. But if there's a hit to that system, then you have to have some sort of manual override in order for you to understand those processes. And I would argue that language is your portal to do that. Yeah, I, brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> listen it's not it's it's not it's not a hard and fast rule believe me it's it's i i think I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think you're right but i also think that um uh look there are many ways of classifying without using language you know we right. have screens we can we can manipulate through our hands yeah. and through our yes stuff. you know the evolutionary arguments that actually our hands came first before any sure. thinking and stuff i i kind of buy into that really you know sure. That, sure. that manipulation and that classification through touch and hands and, yeah uh, you know I, I i think it's there so I, you know i'm really interested in looking at haptics and touch right kids with cvi and classification because you know it i don't want language to mask it right so right. So, I, so like i say this is where we slightly differ but mm. Mm. but you know language is the way of accessing it you know yeah uh, yeah Brilliant, brilliant. You know, I could talk. I could talk all day about this stuff. Absolutely, and and again, by by no means is this you know something with you know you know with sound empirical data. It's purely clinical suspicion and the cases you know that we, that we've worked with, and we, you know, we were very fortunate to work with certain individuals who were very articulate, you know, in terms of what they were doing, and it it kind of just sort of an idea that 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 has been floating, and we have ways of trying to kind of perceive that. Getting back to the idea of neuroimaging, for example, why would that be useful? Well, we know that there are language areas of the brain, right? Yeah. And if those areas are active only when the individual is doing the narration, that would give us, again, some sort of empirical evidence that they are accessing that information somehow. I think that's a nice example of you can do, you can have these, you know, wild theories per se, but test them empirically by looking at the inner workings of the clock. Yeah, yeah, and, and look at the classification areas of the brain. Right? Exactly, because that's all laid out. Exactly, yeah. that's been figured out. So, are they accessing those classifications? And what is what are those modules involved that's doing that? 
I also believe at the same time, much like we said at the beginning, you cannot be such a reductionist that you can parse this all out. I think you really have to look at the brain from a holistic standpoint. And the Human Connectome Project is exactly that. It's looking at the entire brain, all its connections, and how it all kind of comes together, which is important. So yeah, I, I think your point is well, is well taken. But I think there is an opportunity to investigate this and perhaps, as you said, turn this into an habilitative strategy, which I think could be very, very, very useful. Yeah, excellent. So, so here we are. We're in 2020. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, we're coming out of um, uh, uh, the COVID. Who, who knows? Yeah. But, but let's 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 do a, a utopian world, and, and in in the near future, everything yeah. will be as as good as it can be. I guess. Yeah. Where do you see the future research going? What 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 what, what excites you in the near and far horizon? In terms of CVI. Yeah, yeah just, specifically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I would say the biggest issue that excites me is the fact that the communication is better now than it's ever been. And I don't know if it's the technology or the accessibility or what's driving it, but I am seeing much more of an effort to bring this multidisciplinary approach together than I've ever seen in the past as well, which I think is, is the way forward. You know, we had educators doing their thing, clinicians doing their thing, psychologists doing their thing, uh, et cetera, parents, you know, trying to fight for, uh, for their children on their own. And I don't know if that was necessarily the best way forward. I think we made some very, very important advances, but I think the idea of coming together and making this a much more multidisciplinary approach is, is really what's going to bring the field forward. Um, efforts like this, for example, to continue this dialogue, you know, not just from a, a specialty standpoint, but also geographically. You know, CVI, how it's managed, diagnosed in Europe, has subtleties and differences than it is in the United States and the rest of the world. We need to be aware of that. We have to figure out, you know, why are things done differently? Is the population fundamentally different? Is it a question of resources? Is it a question of fundamental thoughts of how, how best to manage? I think those differences need to be understood. Um, so that's what excites me the most. It's, it's the fact that this dialogue is much more open than it was in the past. Um, I think that's a good thing. And I also believe, secondly, the technology is going to advance as well, not just in terms of neuroimaging, but also in terms of assessments. I think also technology at home and in the classroom. There are going to be, I think, some exciting platforms to be able to do things that we couldn't do in the past as well. But again, all that is going to work if it all kind of comes together. If all the stakeholders are present and have their say, I think the field will move forward. And there are many, many examples like this, autism, cerebral palsy, et cetera. That big shift in the advancement of the field happened when people came together. Yeah, I, I, and, I'm, and I'm seeing that. Yeah, I am seeing that joint working now, that multidisciplinary yeah. working now, uh, whereas before, you know, it just didn't happen. And, 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 and it's really encouraging to see it Mm. occur in a time where I think we've had economic um, uh, uh, issues, you know, because normally, you know, when there's lots of money about, yeah, yeah, we'll collaborate with all these guys. And then when the money's tight, no, no, I've just got to do it. That's not what right. we're seeing now. We're still seeing these multi-agencies, multi-collaborate work together. And I think that's, that's right. Really, and I think that's really exciting from that. Yeah. 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 I think for me, if I can answer my own question <laughs> is, 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 so I've, the reason why I did my PhD and the reason yeah. why I've always been, it goes to my master's degree, which I did at Burbeck University in London a long, long, yeah. long time ago, right? Long yeah. ago. But I did it in philosophy, right? And I've been really interested in the nature of representation, right? And I've really wanted to understand what it is in our heads, what it is it that we represent, right? And I've got the theoretical philosophy foundations. You know, I'm a big fan of Donald Davidson as a philosopher. Okay. So I'm a really, I'm a big fan of his. And I've been completely obsessed with trying to understand, can I give an empirical answer to Davidson's theories, right? That's sure. CVI. <laughs> <laughs> There's everything for me, you know? Right. Uh, Right. Your work does it for me. So I, I, what really excites me is I think within the next few years, this very yeah. short term, looking at Marlene Behrman's work, your sure. work, I'm sure. beginning to get an answer to this nature of representation. Good. And, and, Good. I, and I think that the work in CVI is, 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 is outstanding in that. Because if I can yeah. understand 
what children with cerebral vision impairment are representing in their head, in that top down, in that bottom up. Sure. Head, sure. I'm beginning to understand the nature of representation. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, and so I think we need to change your lab, right? <laughs> <laughs> the visual representation. <laughs> yeah, you know, just the, the lab of the nature of representation. Sure. Like, that's what we. And, should. It, it, it's it's interesting because I, I have a similar story, but from the other perspective, I, I started in, in, in hardcore electrophysiology. I remember the first day I walked into electrophysiology lab, it was you know, sort of classic Hubel and Weasel type work. Um, it, it was a cat with an electrode and it was recording from the visual cortex. And I remember walking in front of the cat and I could hear the cell firing, you know, like, you know, just every time I walked in front of it. And I said, wow, I mean, that is the brain cell that sees me. And that's when I said, I want to understand the clock. But then as time went on, I, I, I said, okay, this, was, this has to do more. There, there are people that, that, need, that need assistance. There are bigger you know, fundamental problems, I think, where you can take this technology and this approach and translate it to more real world issues. And I think, you know, again, much like you, starting very, very high and then having you know, a, a more focused understanding of fundamental processes, I was the opposite. I was all about the fundamental processes, but wanted to expand more into more of the practical real world. And again, there's that convergence, right? So I think it makes sense. And the fact that people like us coming from different perspectives are converging is a very, very good sign. Yeah, absolutely. The fact that we now have a shared language, we can share, we can talk about, ex we understand exactly what we're talking about. Right. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, I've taken enough <laughs> of your time. It, your beautiful sunset is, um, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> is moving on. So unless yeah. there's anything else you want to add? Uh, no. Uh, listen, John, I, I, first of all, I, I want to thank you for the opportunity and I want to applaud your efforts. I mean, this is very, very much what we were talking about in terms of continuing the dialogue uh, across specialties and across countries, I think is extremely important, especially now, uh, you know, this will be recorded and time stamped, you know, during this pandemic. I, I appreciate the fact that you keep the dialogue and the conversation going. I think it's extremely important. So thank you. Well, well, I, I well, well, thank you very much for that. But I, uh, I think the uh, the pleasure really is all mine. Where else can I have an opportunity to discuss what's going on in my thoughts? Right. And right. Experts right. such as yourself. So, uh, so you know, it, it, it is it is really good to do these things. But there's a little bit of selfishness. I have to confess that. I, you know, all good, all yeah, good. All good. <laughs> all right, I'll speak to you soon. All Absolutely. Right. Be well and stay safe. Thank you. You too. Bye.